more, okay? I'm gonna play one more and then we're gonna do some more stuff, okay? Maybe you know the next one too. Second one too. You guys hear me through the microphone or you don't hear me? No, does it work? Yeah. Yay. So let me get up. Chest. Vitam. 
Hello. <laughs> it's full house, man. It's crazy. It's really nice. Thank you very much that so many came. Um, let me come here. This is more nice. So, my name is Karim, or actually most people know me as Krim. I'm from Austria, and I have to do everything in English. Is it okay with you? Everybody understands English? My Polish is really eh. <laughs> not very good. So if you have any questions, or I talk too fast, or you don't know what's going on, just either raise your hands or ask your neighbor, okay? Because we're a small group, and let's help out each other, right? So yeah, thank you very much to Mindel. Thank you for Tama, and of course, Drumstore for inviting me. It's really a pleasure. It's been a long day already. I woke up at like 4 or something, traveling whole day to play here, and yeah. So today I want to do a little bit of mix of everything. I don't just want to play songs for you. You've heard two songs right now. Some of you know them. You know my solo project, Scream, maybe? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the first song was called The Tregne Staub, and the second one, Czarne Schmerz. Actually has a Polish name. <laughs> yeah, but as I said, I don't only want to um, play songs for you. Uh, this is supposed to be like some sort of a master class, a clinic. That means you guys are involved as well. I want to talk a little bit about, about techniques. Of course, I guess everybody wants to know about double bass drumming, swivel technique. But there's much more to that, yeah? So we can talk about everything you want. We can talk about foot technique, about pedal setup, about what is important for me, what not. Um, hand technique, of course. And in between, I'm going to play some more songs. Yeah, but if you have any questions, just in between, raise your hands. Oh, and I forgot to say hello to everybody who is at home watching the live stream because we have one hour we have live stream, so chest everybody. Okay, so I guess we start with the main question. Yeah, I want to play fast double bass, but I don't know how. All right, so let's talk about my foot technique and to maybe before we go into very like details how to play what, um, who plays double bass in the audience? Or wants, like who is a double bass player? Almost everybody. You, you don't play drums? No, you just as a visitor here? That's what I like. <laughs> cool, I see we have also young people here and we have some women here, hello. <laughs> um, yeah, so. For some of you, it might be something that you have heard before. For others, it will be new. So I will start with the basics. Um, let me demonstrate on my PowerPoint presentation because I brought one. It's this one. <laughs> so here, there's supposed to be a graphic, OK? What I want to say is that if we talk about double bass drumming, and most people get stuck at a certain point because they want to play very fast, but they don't know how. Yeah, I see some people already like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Come on, give me the tip, give me the tip. There are some tips, but there's also a lot of hard work and hours of practice, yeah? So don't forget about that. It's always hard work. But, so, let's go back to our graphic. If we talk about double bass drumming, let's imagine this is our speed, okay? So from here to here, so it's um, zero beats per minute, like nobody plays. And then we have here till 120, okay? So it's like 120, and then from 120 to 160, 70, and then from there on, we're going crazy to light speed, all right? Does this make sense? So, and depending on your speed, you will have to change your technique. And this is the tricky part, because everybody thinks you can play fast double bass just like, yeah, sit down and go full power. Nope. It's not like that. It's not so easy. Um, actually, I use three different techniques depending on my speed. Maybe um, uh, let me demonstrate you. I will start very slow, and then I will raise it up. And uh, not everybody will see that eventually. But look at my left foot, because you have a nice view. Today I play only with one kick drum. Um, so you can see it a bit better. So we'll raise up the double kick. and. Watch what's going to happen later on when I speed it up. And then we analyze it, okay? Let's do that. So.
fast enough for you? <laughs> All right, so let's analyze what happened here for those who wanna, I wanna know that. Did you see the difference when I started to do later on when it went really fast? I started to do this ruble technique. But even before that, there was a change happening. And this is the crucial part. Everybody who wants to play fast double bass has to understand you have to use your ankle, this guy. This guy is the secret. So for those of you that are stuck at this tempo like, hey, I'm at the mid-tempo area and I play so much double bass and I don't know, I get cramps and stuff. This is probably when you have to make the change. So slow strokes, we do like that. I show it with my right foot because my right foot is the better one. And I will show you here on the side so you can see. So loud strokes. Happen from my full length. Everybody sees that? Makes sense. And I guess most people, you know how to do that. Yeah? And actually what I try to do is I try to be um, in the front with the ball of my foot. I try to be down. And then I push with my heel down. Okay? So when we go faster, the ankle comes in there. But the ankle is at this tempo. Almost ha don't have to do anything. All that happens is in my ankle. This is the secret. And then when we go even faster, technique number three is the swivel technique. You don't need the technique. It's cool to do it, but there are many drummers out there who actually don't need to use the swivel technique. But let's try it. This one. For all the smokers out there, you actually do all the time this movement. Cigarette, and then it's like. <laughs> I don't recommend to smoke, okay? It's very bad. Don't do that. Okay. But um, we do like this that uh, I show you now a little exercise you can do at home. For those of you who want to practice the ankle motion. And I would highly recommend to first do that with your right foot because if you're right-handed, uh, then your right foot is the strong one, right? So start with your right foot. And then I want you to try to find the tempo. Remember my graphics. This one. You have to be here, okay? Right outside of the, the mid-tempo, which is very uncomfortable, even for me. You know, I play, I'm playing for 15 years, 16 years. And still, I feel like, ah, this is not where I feel happy about. If there's a band coming and tell me, like, yeah, I wrote the song, it's 10 minutes long, and it's at uh, 145 beats per minute. I'm like, ah, why? Happened to me, but, you know. So I want you to be outside. Remember, here, we use the full length in here. We want to be right there. We don't want to be right here. We want to be here, okay? Just so that we can find the ankle motion. And then what I want you to do is, I want you to um, increase or like add always a little bit more strokes. We play a very simple beat. It doesn't sound fast at all. You will say like, hey, I wanna play double bass. Why I have to exercise this? You will see. When I play the double bass at this tempo, you will see, ah, okay, it is quite fast. But let's try first to find our tempo. So I would recommend you to start Lower, and we go up. For me, it's around here that I would say I'm going to use my ankle. And then we're going to play a very simple groove, like this. And you will see what I mean, that we always add a little bit more.
get what I mean. I just always increased a little bit and I always added a bit more. But the thing is, at one point you will feel like, ah, okay, I can do two strokes, it's fine. Then I wanna do three strokes, it's okay. Four strokes, ooh, here I have to exercise. So this is where you can slowly get to the point, like to your weak spot. And from there on you practice. And you add a little bit more and when you're able to do that, you will try to do the double bass version. The same idea, same, ite uh, same tempo, and we just um, add a little bit more kick drums, all right? The same with the double kicks. Everybody understands that? We have questions already. Anybody? Or are you all happy already? Okay. I, huh? You're happy? Good. <laughs> so, um, you know what? Dude, I'm warmed up now. As you see, I'm sweating like crazy. So let me play another song. And then we're going to continue with my footwork. And um, I would also try to jump into the swivel technique a little bit. But just to, to um, repeat it once more. Remember, slow double bass, full leg. Faster stuff, ankle motion. All right? And I give you this little tip that also exercise more like short bursts, you know? Don't exercise, you can exercise for like five minutes, you sit there, Yes, of course, this will help you get some stamina, yes? But for me, what is very important is to exercise the stop and go motion because this is the crucial thing. And this is what most people have issues with. They will sit down and it's like, okay, let's play fast double kicks. And then, you know, so the first strokes are always a bit untied and then you're able to, you're able to play this. So that's why it's better to do short Kalashnikov, you know, like a machine gun. That's how it should be. Those are little tricks you can do. All right. Are you happy so far? Having a good time? Everything is cool. I don't want that anybody's bored, okay? Because this is the worst. I have a bored crowd. This is not good. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Let's break the ice, okay? God damn it. All right. So, I play another song. You guys know my band, Septi Clash? Yeah. Okay, cool. So you maybe know the next song. Thank you. 
Thank you. As you heard, pretty epic stuff with a lot of orchestra. Whew, I didn't expect it so hot. <laughs> Before I sound check, it was not that hot. So I'm sweating my ass off for you, all of you here. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> okay, I want to stick a little bit again with the uh, double bass drumming because I also want to talk about other things than only just like technique, you know? So my philosophy behind double bass drumming is, you know, I'm not the craziest, fastest drummer. Like there are other drummers that go way beyond light speed. For me, that was never really a goal. For me, I always wanted to be somehow in the middle of this. Like I wanted to play fast double bass, but I don't need to go super fast. So I'm also able to play a bit slower stuff. But what I want to do is I want to play powerful. And that's actually very difficult to play powerful double bass or in general to play quick and powerful at the same time. And I realized that um, you have either drummers that will go very fast and they play like, <laughs> like that or the opposite, they will just hit shit oops, out of the drums and, uh, but they lack the speed. So to combine both worlds, this has always been a challenge for me. And um, I'm also kind of the drummer now that I'm not really focused so much anymore on speed, but rather more on consistency. Because it's really difficult when you have to play one month, you're on the, on, the, on the road, you have a tour, and you have to play, let's say, three weeks without a day off. You have to perform every day. You didn't sleep well, you're tired. But still, you know, the audience expects 100%. You want to play 100%. So for me, it became more important to somehow understand my body that far or like trick my body to be able to play loud and also precise as good as I can. Of course, I will have bad days happen, you know. You will, you will miss some strokes. I'm not a robot, I'm a human. That's the beauty about it. So as you are, yeah? So. I always want to say that, you know, like you have those dramas in the internet and they look perfect and they play perfect. And then they play live and you're like, eh, what happened, what happened, you know? <laughs> this, doesn't, this doesn't sound well. And I never wanted to be this kind of drummer because being in the studio is a completely different thing than being on the stage or here on the clinic, you know, everybody's watching me, everybody's listening. I'm like, ah, fuck, I missed the stroke. Ah. And everybody, yeah, okay, he made a mistake. You know, so <clears throat> so between the studio and life, there's a completely different world. And um, I'm a performer, I'm a drummer, you know, and I believe, especially in metal, the energy comes from the drums. I might have pissed off a couple of guitar players right now, but for me, when you go to a metal show and the drummer is Napier Dalaj, if you know what I mean, then the show is good. You know, and I always wanted to be this drummer that inspires others, you know, that has an identity. Like, you hear two strokes and it's like, yes, this is Mirek. I know him, you know. So for me, as I said, to repeat it, have an identity, try to find your place. And um, yeah, I want to play loud and powerful, but not crazy loud. It's about finding the sweet spot, you know. Over the time, I have changed my technique a little bit. Um, for example, playing on my cymbals, I used to play them even harder. And believe it or not, there's, I never heard anybody say, I need more cymbals, please hit them harder. <laughs> please, you know. Like put a mic on each cymbal and like, hit as much as you can. No, it was the opposite. So during the time, and with listening, you know, you have to listen a lot. How does your actual drum kit sound like? That's why I have this guy up here. This is uh, just one microphone, goes in my mixer, and I can listen to my drums better because those in-ears, they cut everything, yeah? But yeah, powerful drumming. And there's, of course, technique involved. If you want to play loud double bass, then you have to make a compromise. You will not maybe go, maybe go so fast. 
For me, that's fine. And um, what is important when you want to play loud, you have to find the maximum, um, how does it, motion of the beat there, you know? You can play like this. Well, I try to play quiet. It's almost impossible for me. Or you can play it like that. This is how I would play, you know, just way more power. And there you have to try to get the rebound going, and the same is with the hands, you know, you can hit very hard. The force is coming from your, from your arm, from actually from your shoulder. Even at blast beats, you can kind of push. So for me, it was always, when you're a metal drummer, you should, you should play a little bit louder than if, if you would play in a jazz concert, of course, right? So that has always been important for me. Just play with energy, because this energy will go in the audience, and then people will come up to the show and be like, wow, that was a great show, thank you very much. I feel inspired to go and play. So this is what I, what I always want to do with my drumming. Any questions so far? Or are you just like, no? <laughs> is he done? Uh, okay. <laughs> no. Um, you know what, we, I said before that I wanted to talk a little bit about the swivel technique, right? To, because I'm sure a couple of people are like, hey, I want to learn the swivel technique. How did he do that? I came all the way here that he finally shows me the swivel technique. Remember this one, the cigarette. <laughs> this one, yeah. All right, let me explain. Now we come again to the dry technique stuff for all the drum nerds out there. All right. So, the motion with the cigarette is actually not such a bad thing. What you do is, you try to imagine that you have a nail through your foot that will basically lock the front of your foot on the pedal, okay? Does this make sense? Um, and you have to do the motion, not in the front, but in the back, okay, with your heel, right? So you apply pressure with this part, I'm very stretch, like I can stretch a lot, like a ballerina. <laughs> so you apply the pressure with the ball of the foot, all right? As you would normally do when you do a hard or loud stroke. Same thing is here. Here you always keep the balance. And then what you want to do is, for each side movement, all right? You make one stroke, this is the idea. So for those who don't see it, my foot does like this. Tuck, 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 tuck. Sounds easy, it's not. And uh, it took me a couple of years, and actually it developed on its own. So when I started to play, I never wanted to learn this technique, it just happened, yeah? And then later on, some guy on YouTube writes like, hey, you play the swivel technique. Like George Collier. I'm like, who is George Collier? What is the swivel technique? I thought I'm God and I just invented a new technique, but I didn't. Others had the same idea. But the idea was that when I play faster kicks, I try to avoid cramps. And the idea was I will move around. A little bit up, to the side, without any rhythm, you know, just move around, use different muscles, you know, because your leg doesn't consist out of one muscle, he has a lot of muscles, and you can trick yourself a little bit. And then the idea was, okay, let's do it rhythmically, we're gonna do a side motion to that. That made more sense, right? But how to do that with two legs, because you don't play No, you play always one in between. Did you, do you remember back in the days there was this skateboard? It was called wave board. Have you, has, does anybody know that? Like it was two separate parts and you had to do like this weird wave motion. You know this is what I'm talking about? You were able to do it or not? I was always too stupid for that, but actually now it reminds me a lot, you know? It's kind of the same technique, the same 
wave motion that's going on because you have to like start with your right. I do, um, I go out, then my left one is following it, it goes in, then the right one comes in. Looks like this. Ah, wait. Uh, 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 uh. Slow. But nobody's gonna use this technique slow because nobody's gonna sit there and like. Why to bother your brain if you can just play? It's stupid, you know, it makes no sense. So it only makes sense for me to when you when you play faster. And that's why <coughs> the same idea as we did before with the ankle, remember? We increase the stroke. Same idea. We start with our right foot, the strong one, and then we're gonna play. Actually, you don't see this right now. I was just played here, why not? And um, we just increase, and you try to focus on the motion, yeah? So it looks like that. But before you want to play a swivel technique, please exercise your ankle. This is the secret. It's a lot about the ankle motion. If you're not able to do that, then it's going to be difficult later on. All right? Any questions? I will keep asking till the end. Any questions? Yes. Uh, when I try to practice the swivel technique, I play out loud in the middle. Yes, you do the other way. Yeah. It's also possible. <laughs> it's, it's whatever your brain decides to do. Okay. For me, it took me actually a while. Like, I was playing, yeah? And I looked down, I was like, whoa, what's going on? Okay, do I actually understand what I'm doing? No. And then I slowed it down and slowed it down, and then I realized, okay, I actually do it this way. But it's not wrong what you're doing. He mentioned, like, he does an opposite thing. Um, basically, the right foot follows exactly the left foot, like this. So you're doing like, uh, you go out, out, in, in. And I do out, in, in, out. <laughs> so in the end, it's kind of the same movement. It's just like, uh, it's just however your brain will make it easier for you. So you're on a good path. <laughs> or you feel like it's uncomfortable. When I try to play it your way, I feel like uh, I'm losing balance because yeah. it's more of a, like a rocking motion when two legs go in the same way yes. direction. You're right. It's, uh, that's why it took me a couple of years. It's always funny when people come to me and say like, hey, I want to learn a swivel technique. Okay, we have one hour. It's not going to happen, you know, because it took me years. And still, even now, I'm, it's always a struggle to perfect the balance. And sometimes my left foot is like, eh. You know, he's moody or something is off, the balance in the hip. And I totally understand what you say. Because you have the extra movement going on, you have to balance more up here. It's more difficult. So it will take some time. It might take some years. Others, maybe just a couple of months. But it's a, a matter of don't stopping, you know. Just keep going. But yeah, you don't do it right. Uh, wrong, sorry. <laughs> you do it right. <laughs> okay. Um, I would suggest to, I'm gonna try to play two more songs now before I cool down and then we can tackle some other topics. Remember guys, I'm there for you, you know? Yeah, I have more, uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> did you have, have you ever uh, had issues with sliding off the pedal during, during the- The swivel? Um, yes, a little bit at my early days. And that's why I was mentioning before, try to imagine to have this nail going through, you know? Because you're probably moving too much in the front. And I think you should avoid that. It's not about slipping on the whole pedal around. You have to have one solid point, yeah? And then from there, you're gonna move in the back. What also helps me a lot is to think of applying pressure on the pedal, you know? 
So remember, I just smoked a cigarette, not for real. Yeah, on the same spot. So try to imagine when you play, try to, to really like push a little bit in the pedal so that the front of the pedal, of the foot, sorry, that the front of the foot always stays on the pedal and doesn't slide around. Yeah? And your position on the, on the footboard is more like uh, up or down because I saw people doing it right on the, down on the pedal to get more speed and uh, on the pedal to get more power. Yes, that's another good thing. Like, where shall I put my foot on the footboard? It sounds like a random question without like, obviously just put it in play. No, 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 no. You have had a good point. When you want to play extreme or like fast stuff, even this, the smallest change of like how far I'm on the footboard does play a role, yeah? So for me, I try to kind of find my balance point and it's more um, in the center to low. My spring tension and with also with this pedal setup is kind of heavy. And um, if I would go all the way in the back here, it would be too much of a resistance, you know. If I would go all the way in the front, it's a bit lighter. But honestly, I sometimes do this on purpose that I, I know this part is a bit quicker and I try to play more forward. So I adjust depending on the speed. Yeah? So for all of you that have struggles with playing double bass, um, you can also try to change uh, your position on the footboard. It might really make the difference to find the perfect balance point. Yeah? It's two at one, it's crazy. Okay. I have questions from the guys online. Okay. Uh, one person asking uh, about the uh, pedal you are using. Uh, Which pedal do I use? <laughs> Uh, but, Correct. Uh, it's, uh, you can see it, but <laughs> can you tell a little more about it uh, and uh, uh, why you're using charge and uh, the second person asking about the triggers. So, uh, okay. so good. Let's do those two questions then I play other songs because otherwise I will cool down and then I will play really shitty. And I don't want to play shitty, I want to play the best for you. Yeah. Only the yeah. best. Yes. Okay. So. I play Charchi Copito because it's an amazing pedal. It survives literally everything. Um, I mean by everything I mean talking about touring life and performing on stages, like the gear is throwing around, you cannot really take care of, or airports. Everybody who is flying, sometimes your luggage comes back and it's completely destroyed, but the pedal is not destroyed because it's so solid. And this is what I like about it, you know, it's a pedal that is just too massive. It's actually too much, you know, <laughs> it's so heavy and so sturdy. I call it Polish tank. This is my nickname. It's not official name, but for me, is it solid as a, a tank? And I use it because um, also it gives me the power. Sometimes direct drive pedals don't give me the power. What do I mean by direct drive pedal? Look here. Do you see this part? That connection part here is stiff. Everybody saw that in the front? Okay. For those who don't know, because there are, not, there are a couple of drummers, not drummers in the audience, this pedal right here, whoop, this is a chain pedal. So what happens when the pedal goes up, look, you see this play in the, in the spring, uh, sorry, in the chain? This cannot happen with the direct drive. Because if you do that, everything's going to move up. So direct drive pedals usually are used by faster drummers because it's, it's somehow easy to play fast. But not only, I mean, James, I know he was playing here, James from Vader, he did a drum clinic. So he beats the drummer, amazing drummer, he plays chain uh, pedals and he can do it as well. So, And yeah, actually this is the answer to it. It's just the best quality you can have for the money and it uh, survives a lot and you can play loud but also quiet so that's why I love Charcha and it's made in Polska come on <laughs> eh. applause 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 you should be proud of it it's really like I need 
so many dramas on the road and everybody's like, wow, you know, what is this pedal? What is this crazy thing? And I say, yeah, it's handmade in Poland. So very nice. Okay, and triggers. Another guy talked about triggers. Well, I guess he wants to ask about what kind of triggers I use, right? I think so. Okay. I only trigger my kick drum. So this Mickey Mouse sound that is a little bit here, this one. Yep. This is the trigger. Why do I trigger my kick drum? Why do we have to do that? Because it's just too fast, you know? When I play really fast double bass with all the guitars, it just sounds like So that's why a metal drummer is gonna use triggers. Some say it's cheating, I would say not. Because if I have a bad day and it sounds like popcorn, it doesn't help, you know? So triggers are, they just amplify it, yeah? If you're not able how to play it, then it will show your mistakes more, you know. And I use uh, triggers called the foot blaster, which are mounted underneath the pedal. I don't think that people will see it. If you want afterwards, you can come check out my setup, all in the detail, and you just look underneath the pedal. There's a small sensor, and whenever I hit the pedal, it actually, the pedal board hits the trigger. And I have another one on this side. So there's not a trigger on the skin anymore. The trigger is underneath the pedal. And it, they say it's the, like a new universal thing because you can put the trigger on any pedal you want. I can take it off, put it on this pedal, and it will work. And you can tune the kick drum uh, as low as you want or not. So this is the advantage. All right, so if you have more questions, keep them after the next two songs. I will try to play them together. Um, they're gonna be a bit faster. They're gonna be a bit more in your face. I re recorded a couple of YouTube videos lately with a bunch of friends. Now we have a name for this thing, Locust. Somebody maybe have heard it. And I'm gonna play two songs out of them and uh, enjoy.
right. Give the next one a shot.
Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Karim, can we make the contest now? Of course, apparently there's a contest today. Yeah. I heard just five minutes before entering the stage. <laughs> there's a contest today. Yeah. Let's do it right now. Uh, to przepraszam, muszę przejść po uh, karteczki. Czy wszyscy tutaj wrzucili karteczkę? Czy no, nie? Drop your stuff. Okay. Apparently you can win something. Yeah. yeah. Co? No, 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 no. To, ale czekajcie, każdy po, każdy po jednym razie. Każdy po jednym razie. Dobra. To co, już tam wy, wy, wyłączono, tak? Ja ci będę... e, nie, teraz misję wyłączamy po konkursie. Dobra, to najpierw te mniej prominentne nagrody, no nie? Ok, wrzucajcie. Wrzucajcie, wrzucajcie, wrzucajcie te... Musi być jakaś losująca maszyna. E, losująca maszyna. Dobra, to jeszcze... Ok. Chciałem zapytać, czy ktoś oszukiwał i dwa razy wrzucił? <laughs> Rozumiem, że nie. Uh, they want to be like uh, uh, men. To choose? To choose. Of course, guys. So yours? So, okay. I'm gonna choose, but please don't be pissed that I didn't pick you, okay? In case. Okay. It's official that I don't look aside, okay? So I'm gonna take this one. Dobra. E, Kasia Skrzypiec. Zobaczamy. Gratulacje. Mój mąż na pewno będzie wiedział, co to jest. Congratulations. A, dobra, yeah. okej. Okay. Dobra. Dobra. Jeszcze raz, no. Jeszcze pięć razy. Pięć we razy. Have, we have a lot of uh, <laughs> prizes. Okej. Okay. Oliver, and this other word I cannot... Yeah, okay, you know. Yes, you. <laughs> you got something. Yeah. <laughs> Oczywiście dodam, że e, nagrody są sponsorowane przez firmę Mine. Bardzo dziękujemy. Yes. <laughs> okay. Jakbyście się zastanawiali, co kupować, to. <laughs> Can you read it? O, 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 Bogusław Chyliński. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bardzo dziękuję. Congratulations. Here's the round game, and vielen Dank. <laughs> Bitte gerne. Vielen <laughs> Dank. Where are the snares? Oh. <laughs> Later for the, because how many more we have? Two more? Two more. Two more, okay. Two the biggest. <laughs> Those are the main prices or what? No, no, no main. It's okay. It's the main prices. The price. one, there's a symbol, yeah. Marian. Where's the Marian? Marian is the rich. Richa? Richa. Oh. Richa. Yeah. Whoa. Gratuluję. Dziękuję bardzo. Taki pacik. Jest. Proszę. Congratulations. Gratulacje. Teraz to powinien... Główna nagroda. Powinien być werbel. Kalesz. Yeah, here, here is the drum sound. To jest taka sama blaszka, jak i używa Kelly. Dokładnie. Dokładnie. This one. Tylko, że większa. A nie, very nice one, very nice one. Nie, nie to sama? A, dobra. Yes, okay. Sama. I cannot read this. Eric Ga... Eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
double bass drumming we have covered everything except do you have any other questions now i think it's the time we do the question i see a couple of questions yes Seat position, yes. Honestly, I I'm playing drums for how many times? 15, 16 years. And when I look at my videos, my position is like literally changing all the time. I don't know how. I think that my body sometimes needs a little bit of a change. Um, I don't like to sit too high. Let's say it like this. Like when you look back at Inferno in his old videos, he was almost standing behind the drums. He was like. Christian, I love Christian. He's the best. But um, also, if I sit too low, you know, I definitely want to be above the 90 degrees. Yeah, so 90 degrees would be the lowest I would sit. Sometimes I try to do that, but I feel that my back hurts a little bit after some time. It's weird thing. If I sit lower, I somehow have more control at the uh, slower tempos, and I can hit really hard. It makes more sense to me. But when I want to go faster, it somehow feels like when I have to lift my leg a little bit, you know, I have to do more because from this position, I have to move it higher. So I try to sit a little bit above the 90 degrees, like, yeah. But it changes a little bit, you know. So try that out. Some people say that you should put the seat next to your knee and just right above the knee. but. I've played on five million different drum chairs, and some of them are compression like this, and others are like a brick, you know, so it's always hard to choose a place. And um, when I have 20 minutes changeover, I don't really care about how high do I sit. I'm like, all cymbals are here, electronic is plugged in, do I hear something? Okay, no you jam, pop, 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 and let's go. You know. Good? Perfect. always play and have always played with earplugs. So actually, uh, not even once, I've played longer than five minutes without earplugs. And I know that I have a good hearing because actually today when I was going to the train station, there was this little sound for the birds and it's super, 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 super high. Most people don't hear that. But to me, it hurts in my ears. And when I go with my friends, I'm like, <laughs> like what happened? You don't hear that? But no their hearing is obviously fine. So I always play with earplugs, and nowadays with in-ears. Obviously, you know, I have the click track, and I have my own kick drum inside, so it's just, m I got used to it, you know. I don't understand how my band can play without earplugs, without in-ears, old school, just monitor, in the back, you know, it's crazy. So please protect your ears. I know Lemmy probably would say like, no, no, you have to be old school, but um, please put some stuff inside you because yeah, he's he's a good boy, you know. He has some stuff in his ears. Look at him, young, and he takes care of his hearing. So please always play with that. I saw you got yes. My right hand check. It's not actually a double stroke. I use the mullet, especially for my right hand. You know, my right side is stronger, obviously, and it does do more hits, and on the right cymbal, more, and uh, it's a lot of hits. So what I do, and I know we had a practice box here, but I don't know where it didn't go, but it doesn't matter. I can do it on the chair. I can do it on the chair. It's actually better because there's no rebound. So, the mellow technique, what you do, instead of playing stiff, this will work just a little bit and then later on you will feel like, oh, am I on the correct tempo? Or, you know, you might not be able to stay on the tempo. 
So what you do is you throw in extra. Right? Look at that. Three packs, I need one. I have two hands. But no, no, I should leave it that high. It's perfect. Because then people can see in the back. Perfect. Thank you very much. Don't worry about it. So, <coughs> yeah. All right. So, so as you said, if. And with the melon. Just to slow it down for you, what happens here? So basically, you have a large stroke. And you see this motion, like almost like an S motion. And somehow, it starts up in the shoulder. It's a very, very small movement, yeah? But again, I can make accent that is musically very interesting. If you take, if you just go. Play with the play with the riff first, and you play a there is a blast beat, and the riff is like <laughs> right. So you can do a lot with this technique. It not only helps to stay on the tempo, it also makes it more musical. That's why I like it. And you can try to exercise this differently, that you are um, try to play to the music, for example, to the riff, as I just mentioned, or you try it with different accents that we have here. Are you so interested? You see how much movement is actually happening in my elbow and in my whole arm. It's not only focused down in the wrist. Like Make sense? You can actually also do this with the left one, but it's a bit more tricky. Why I'm doing this with the left one a little bit? Some of you that when I played some blast beats, let's maybe talk a bit about the hand technique. Um, what I do when I play fast with the left one, I try to do a similar thing. I try to move my hand around just to use different muscles, yeah? But here, I don't want to hear this. Because on the snare, it's kind of weird. But the trick is here to play on the same spot. And then you just try to move your hand. Like this. You try not to hear it that much. What you can do to exercise that. It's actually very simple, but nobody does it. You play at the same time. Like this. Because everybody would always exercise this. And the trick and the key here is that you don't have the to be at the same time with this. And this strengthens your left arm and gives it more like a better connection with your brain, yeah? So try this out at home. Sometimes it's an easy exercise that is very effective. So you can use this Mela technique also with your left hand, right? Any other question to this? Where shall we go? Then we have to go to the gym. <laughs> I tell you this. From this is another topic I have always changed over the years, and it's somehow very difficult to to find the perfect 
warm up that works every day all the time. For me, I have still haven't found it yet. I'm close. I feel I'm close. But what I do, because it is very demanding as a job, stretching, I've got to sit hard, I have a lot of energy. So for me, if I would sit in a vacuum cleaner and just use a pad and do like <laughs> it will warm up my small muscles, but it will not warm me up. So usually what I do is I would do like a little workout. Ten push-ups, jumping jacks, a couple of squats. Sometimes I would do the amazing pistol squat. Ten of them each side. <laughs> and um, what else? Yeah, a couple sit-ups. And then I feel like I'm sweating. You know, I feel ready. And on some occasions, I would even go and run around the cons uh, like the, the club. Five minutes, not more. Just to the point that you feel like you start to sweat. And another cool thing is when you go running, you just get out of the madness. There's so many people. Everybody is like, ah, they're going on stage. And you're nervous. And you just get out, you run in five minutes, you come back, the sweat kicks in, yeah. the brain, oxygen, bam, bam, bam. And then, then I do the classic one. But because the practice rooms are always small, I cannot take a practice pad even with me. I cannot take a, a pad for the kicks or anything. You know. There's no space for that. I have to fly everywhere. So what I do is I would find whatever seat chair, table, and I would put the iPad in, and I would play the first three songs like that. So you will see me like 15 minutes, 10 minutes playing like that. I don't piss off any one of my bands because it's going to take you five seconds until somebody turns around and says, shut up. Yeah. It's the truth, you know. I always try to do things that actually work. Um, so, yeah, as you and uh, I have just done a tour, which is seven weeks long, 45 shows. You can imagine when you do every day this workout, it's like, oh, you know, and I start stretching. But I prefer stretching after the show. But this is my routine. It's going to take like 20 minutes to 30 minutes, something like that. And sometimes there's no warm-up. It's just like go on the stage. Like <laughs> you had a, next to you, you had a question. Oh, I don't have the uh, iPad Pro. Okay, I'm still. You go? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I know this, this project, I would wish we could do more. But uh, yeah, everybody knows Ola Englund, and she puts up every five seconds a new video. I don't know how he does that. Like, literally, probably right now, when we speak, three new videos for sure. And um, so, you know, he's busy, I'm busy. I cannot even do a new solo album. It's really difficult for me. I'm sorry. I want to play some Keith Merrill songs afterwards. Do you accept that maybe? If we have time. Do you know Keith Merrill? It's not so obvious, but it's more for the brain. It's also nice. It's very groovy. At least one song I like. Okay. Another question somewhere? Why did I try to sloth? Obviously, I lost the stick for that time. I felt like when I start to sweat, I, I, I hold the stick too hard. And probably was also a mental thing. Like, you go on the stage and you don't have 100% the grip and you just hold on to them. Like, I will not lose you. You cannot fly away, you know? And then you cramp up and you get cold. So I tried the gloves. The gloves work well, but the problem is, after some time, just because they're leather, they soak up with the heat and sweat. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they're super stiff, so you take them out and they're like... And then another 
thing happened that the son only on the bottom was the ladder. On the top is the high ladder. And sometimes the son would spin and then I would have to slip a little nylon on the bottom, you know, and then they stick it high way. So you can hear that? Okay, so I use tape now and actually I really like it a lot because I since on this seven week tour I did not even lose one push stick. Never. I only lose six if they get caught underneath the right window. But they're never gonna fly away during uh, playing because of stress. And uh, Janne from Dark Funeral, he's gonna play with tape right now because of me. I infected him twelve weeks. Another band on this tour switched, I gave them a pair of mine that I still have. So you should try that out. It's really nice. This is just a win for a football. Because it will chew through the tape first, then I change the tape, and it's like it keeps it tight. So that will work. This is duffel tape. And um, bad stuff. So it will eventually break, but I can put, I could give another piece of tape on now, and I can play with that. so loud. I think it would be actually good if it would do something and makes it a little bit more compact, but I don't think so much because it's just a piece of uh, small layer. Oh, and another thing, because usually I play with open hair and when the stick starts to splinter, then my hair gets caught all the time and it comes all over. And with the tape, it somehow holds it all together. That's the idea. Okay, any other questions? Uh, how are we doing with the time, actually? Shall we do that? I want to play two songs. They're actually, anyways, a bit longer. Not El Quack, sorry, but Keith Marrow, okay? So it's going to be two songs. It's a bit more technical stuff. But it's very nice, too. Uh, you will see. It's nice. And then we're done for the evening, and uh, except we have some more questions, okay? Let's do that.